All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Uh, I think we're missing a couple people, but we've got a time scheduled to keep. Um, our next presenter is going to be Johnny Kingslake, who's going to be chatting with us about AP res data and how we create um, cloud optimized data and um, do all the steps to produce that, which can be pretty complicated. So um, I'll turn it over to Johnny. Okay. Let's chat straight into that. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I suppose we get started. So this morning was, I thought, absolutely incredible, right? So the like the quality of the tools people were talking about this morning was, I was actually blown away by this. So I'm I'm coming to this whole topic as a as a as a novice completely, and I'm going to talk from a, the perspective of somebody who's relatively recently got into this way of working and. Um, come across some of the problems probably some of the common problems people encounter with trying to get a new data set into a format in which these tools can be effective <clears throat> so specifically there's this concept of, of an analysis ready cloud optimized data set and this is a term, you know, it's, it's essentially what it sounds like. It's optimized to be stored and accessed from the cloud and it's ready for analysis. And there are many, there are a few different formats of data set, uh, of data storage. Like there are cloud optimized geotiffs, which are going to be talked about next. And there are czars, and that's what I'm going to talk about, um, today. Uh, so. And specifically, I'm going to talk about putting a particular a raid, ice penetrating radar data set into a czar format and talk about the issues associated with that. And so to get to that point, I don't actually need to go through X-Array and Dask, I don't think, because we had quite a lot of really nice introductions to that this morning. But actually, first of all, who has, I just want to do a little poll, a, a comprehensive poll. So who here has used Python before? Who here has used NumPy before? Who here has used X-Array before? Who here has used Dask before? Okay, so there's that. So I went, I made the mistake of trying to learn all of those all at the same time, about two years ago or during the pandemic. I was a MATLAB user for years and years and years, and I tried to take on all of those things at once, genuinely including Python. So you're already, you've already done the right thing, learn Python, NumPy, and X-Array in that order, I think. And then Dask and Zara and all these other things, because it was it was difficult, I've got to say. Any case, we've done we've done X-Array, and all I'll say about that is that X-Array is this framework where it can either have NumPy arrays or Dask arrays in it. And um and now we we learned a lot about Dask arrays this morning. I just need to check these. Can you ask them to make the font size larger? Yes. How do I do that? Just zoom. Better? Okay. So I'm actually going to skip most of my Dask stuff, but if you are if you are interested in running this along with me, um, you'll need to uh, start run that cell there, which starts up a, a Dask cluster, and then once you've run that. You will be able to start a one of these dash uh, one of these dashboards, which Ellie talks about, and just by clicking on this button here. So we will be. I'm going to just move that over there, and also the, the other thing you need, the thing I actually forgot to do. If you would like to, if you are running along with me here, and you want to change how many workers you have in your cluster, you can just type in client.cluster.scale and then put in the number of workers you want to use and I've just made it up to 10 because that's actually something which is missing from the notebook as is. So I'm skipping through our X-Array and Dask stuff. And now I'm going to talk about this, uh, my use case. So this is a specific use case. So this is a um, data set which has come from a face sensitive radio echo sounder. So that's a, a, a ice penetrating radar, which 
is a static system that sits there on the surface of the ice sheet or glacier and takes repeated measurements. And um, I'm going to be using a particular um, library, which we've been developing, which is called XAP Res. And mostly it's been me, uh, George Liu, and Elizabeth Case have been the developers of that so far. And the whole point of that is to get this kind of data into an X-ray-like structure or into an X-ray structure. And the reason for that is because this radar is capable of producing quite complicated, complex structured data. So I'm going to try and explain that. So every time you take a measurement with this radar, you get 40,001 real numbers back. And that's actually a, a chirp. It's a, chirp, a second long chirp, if you know much about radar, but don't worry too much about that. That's one dimension. And then you also tend to do many chirps all at once. And so, and that's that dimension that we do, you know, 20 or a hundred chirps all at once, one after another, I should say. And then we wait some period of time and do another bunch of chirps. And also you can set it up so you have multiple settings on this radar. So it cycles through them. So each time you do this, you have a three-dimensional cube of data, three-dimensional um, set of data. And then you do it every, I don't know, 15 minutes or an hour for as many, as long as you have battery power, basically. So there's, so what I've tried to depict in this image is a four dimensional data set. And once you get to four, once you get above two dimensions, X-Array is a really great tool for this because it, it arranges your, it helps you keep track of which dimension is which basically. So that's the motivation for wanting to put this data into that format. So we can, what we can do is just load this little library called XAP res. Um, you have to pip install it because it's not it doesn't become standard, and uh, then and then import that data set as XA. So wherever you see that, I'm calling a function from XA. The specific data is was collected by a team led by Lamont uh, scientist Meredith Nettles and Oxford University of Oxford scientist Laura Stevens, and included a whole bunch of other people. And um, this actually from these units deployed on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet around several supraglacial lakes. I can't fit the whole map on the screen, but you get the idea. These blues are supraglacial lakes. This white is the surface of the green and ice sheet in the ablation zone. And then these, these symbols are GP, GNSS stations and AP res stations. Just sat there taking measurements, getting one of those three dimensional data sets every 15 minutes for 18 months. <clears throat> So let's have a let's take a look at some of this raw the raw data, and this is using some tools from this library. You know, it doesn't really matter. But the main point is, this is this is a binary. These are binary files stored in the cloud, but they're not cloud optimized. They're just normal files. There's no we don't have any fancy way of accessing them uh, with ZAR or anything or any of these cloud optimized tools. We just have to load them individually. So that's going to be a problem later. So I've loaded one of them individually. Let's look at how long it is. It's 40,001 as expected. And we can just put out that shirt. And actually, if you're interested, it's a second long time series. And this is the amplitude. And it's a deramp signal. I can talk at length about what all that means. But let's not worry too much about it. It's, the aim of the game is really just to um, convert this into a profile of of amplitude with depth, and that's what we can do with this line here. We don't need to worry about the details of this, and that's that's what you get every time you take one of those chirps and you do a hundred of them in every burst, and you do many many bursts. All right, so this next this this was the main effort in writing this library was making this uh, function called generate X-ray. What it does is loops through all of these these binary files, which the, which the radar produces called DAP files, and then puts them into a sensible format in an X-ray. Now this cell takes three, four minutes to, to run. So I'll just, I've just got a screenshot of the, of the format of this X-ray here. And what you see is you've got several dimensions. You've got time. I've only got 94 bursts in this particular one, I've got chirp time. That's 40,001. That's that dimension. We've got 20 chirps per burst. So that's that dimension. And then this is the, the different settings. 
And then you have the data variables down here. One of this chirp is the thing I just plotted. Oh, the first thing I plotted. And then this profile is the second thing I've plotted. Um, really the main point is that it's a complicated data set and keeping track of this without X-ray would be a bit of a nightmare. But it's impractical. If you want to start looking at whole seasons or 18 months worth of data, it's impractical to run this function every time. This function, again, is going off to the, the raw data, doing all the processing um, individually on non-cloud optimized data, and then presenting you with a X-ray. But this is only doing 95 out of like 10,000 bursts, and it's taking three, four minutes while we're waiting here. So we can't do this every time we want to do any processing. No, we, what we need to do is write all this data into a new format, into a cloud optimized uh, uh, analysis ready cloud optimized format and that's that's we can we're going to use czar for that oh and once that's done this is just showing off x-rays capabilities which we we probably have already covered but this is what the data look like this is only over you know one day but this is depth vertically and time horizontally and the color is in decibels the the power returned and this is the bed of the ice sheet running horizontally and all these are persistent reflectors. Now, if you've ever looked at radiograms, it's, it's tempting to look, think of this as a radiogram, but it's not, it's not the, uh, it's not the radar moving across the surface. It's taking repeat measurements at the same spot and any persistent, like any horizontal line is just a persistent reflector coming back up from that depth. So, I mean, you know, as a side to this, the main point of this presentation, we were very happy to see a bunch of horizontal lines. It's not just noise. We're seeing through the ice, even in the ablation zone, where you may be worried that you wouldn't see too much. We are seeing reflectors, you know, up to 600 meters deep, and we're seeing the bed reflector. So that's great. And I should have said, the, the science that has been done with this is going to be presented by George Liu um, and Stacey La Rochelle, two, two talks on Wednesday, actually back to back. So if anyone's interested in that, take a look. So but the only way George managed to do any of this is through the Cesar stuff. So let's skip straight through to this. What we're going to do is um, we're going to first write, just so we have it recorded, we're going to write a small amount of this data to Czar. And you can do that too, because there is this scratch bucket. A bucket is just a storage location in the cloud. And this is um, CryoCloud's scratch bucket. And this is the way you access it. So all this is doing is making a, a string, which um, appends your GitHub name to the location to the scratch bucket. And you can see what's in there already. I've got three directories I've made. So I'm going to make, make sure I have to don't try and overwrite those. I'm going to make a small version of the data just, and let's see how big that is actually. Yes, yeah, small. It's only, it's only 70 megabytes, so that's good. And I'm going to write it to Zar just to show you that it works. So um, essentially you are using F, FS spec to get something which looks a bit like a file um, file name based on based off this scratch string and I've appended on some other, uh, the name of a directory which I'm going to generate. And then this basically just to czar is a x-ray function which takes a little x-ray and then writes it to czar and you have to supply the, the location that shouldn't take too long and we'll be able to immediately just reload the data and make sure that it's exactly the same as the thing we um we sent so this is that line here it's reloading it let's not bother with the output and then what we do is actually just check is that identical to the thing we 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 wrote it from and yes it is and what you might have noticed is some things are picking up, uh, 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 showing up here in, in the dash dashboard, and the reason is because we are loading from a cloud optimized geotip, a cloud cloud optimized uh, format, ZAR, and therefore our dask cluster is suddenly kicking into action and doing some of this work for us. So we've got ten workers there, all of it, all of them taking some of this work. Actually, that was a tiny amount of effort. It was only seventy megabytes being sent off and seventy megabytes being reloaded, and then at this point we actually had to load that 70 megabytes 
to check that it's the same as the thing we sent. So it's all relatively small, it's only 70 megabytes, but still it did it um, in a distributed way across this DAS cluster, so that's good. Um, okay, so now the question is, how do we do this for all of our data set? The problem you run into immediately is that we can't actually open every DAT file in our memory because we you can estimate about how much it should be. It should be it's going to be about six hundred gigabytes because you take the size of one DAT file times it by the number of DAT files. That's what you get. In principle, we could just keep loading them, loading them, loading. That's what our library was all about, making it able, making us capable of doing that. But we would run out of memory in this in this notebook, and we would be nowhere. So this is where we have to dig into the weeds a little bit, and I hopefully won't lose you too much. But this was a lot of work, and we came up with a workflow which essentially took every DAP file, loaded it into memory live in the notebook, then wrote it to a small czar, did that for all you know, 200, um, 200 separate files. And then, so that's actually what this, this is just a bit of code which does this, you know, it just loops through these and just writes them to czar and that's totally fine. Then the next step is to lazily load. So Ellie was talking about how lazily loading, um, which is basically where you don't take any of the data, you just you just load a representation of that data, a little frame saying, this is how big it's gonna be and this is where you're gonna get it from when you need it. So you do that for every single one of your czars and then you concatenate still lazily. Then you say, now I wanna write all of that to one big czar and then only at that moment does your does the computation start and it happens in the cluster and so never do you have to bring 600 gigabytes to your notebook machine it just goes by the cluster and each worker in this cluster you know you could use a hundred of them if you wanted each one of them takes one loads it into its own little memory then writes that and then they and it automatically glues together all those czars into one huge one so great, that's that 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 was our approach, and and we thought this was going to work. <laughs> in fact, what happened was you should ru start running this, and gradually the memory in your notebook starts building up and up and up until we were using a sixty-four gigabyte machine, so four times bigger than in here we are today, and eventually it just reaches sixty-four gigabytes and dies. <clears throat> so. The issue, whoops, sorry. So the issue was chunking again. Because I skipped my introduction, we didn't talk about chunking, but we did this morning. It's it's the size of the little bits of data which the DASC arrays are divided up into. You can never load less than one chunk. You can load more than one chunk, but you can never get half of a chunk or less. Um, and I wanna show you what happened essentially. So. This little cell here goes through all these individual czars, which I talked about, all the small ones, loads them, and then just tells us the size of the chunks. In fact, it's just set, because we're in a multi, a four-dimensional array, the chunks themselves are four-dimensional. It's actually just showing the, the length of those chunks in one of the dimensions, which is the length, it, it, which is the time dimension. That's what this um, what this stuff does here. It says which which dimension do we want to print out? Oh, well, let's find that in our X array, get axis num, and then print out that element of this thing, which is chunks. It, chunks is the attribute of your X ray, which tells you which, how big the chunks are. So the chunk size along the, the time dimension, these are seven different czars, which will show this, and they all have different sizes. That's the issue, basically. So the first one has one, a, a chunk size of one in the time dimension. The next one has four chunks of three. The next one has three ones, a 10. And then here's some, here's <laughs> seven chunks of 12 and a 10 at the end. So our workflow involves gluing all these things together along the time dimension. Sorry if that wasn't clear originally. At one point, we had to load each one of these czars, glue them all together in the time dimension, and then shunt it off to the cloud again as a new czar. Well, if you do that without doing anything clever, what you get is a whole series of differently sized chunks in the time dimension. 
because these are the chunks we're trying to glue together. And actually we can just look at what that, let's, let's, let's load some of these, glue them together and then look at what you actually get. Again, our, our DAS cluster is springing into life and doing some of the work for us. Um, that's good. I mean, it works. It, wo it loaded those ZARs and glued them together for us. But now let's look at the chunk size. And here's the chunk number along the horizontal and the chunk size vertically. It's varying a lot because of that argument I had before. Each ZAR individually had different chunks. So when you take each one of them and glue them all together, you're going to end up with a whole series of different chunks. And ZAR, as a rule, cannot deal with that. It cannot ha have non-uniform chunks within a dimension. They can be differently sized in different dimensions, but they, in one dimension, they have to be uniformly chunked, at least this version of ZAR. Maybe the next version apparently is not going to have this requirement. So I told you I was getting into the weeds. <laughs> <clears throat> so this was a major issue. And what was going on is that at the time when we were trying to write the huge ZAR, it was undergoing this rechunking exercise where it says, it basically reorganizes all the chunk sizes into a uniform chunk size and that it, as a rule seems to be a rule that it's incredibly computationally expensive to do that and the reasoning i think is that we have this this is the original data set with all these different sized chunks there's one chunk with three elements here's here's one with four a two a two and a one and then you try and get them all into a uniform size well this to write this one chunk you have to you have to load two different chunks which itself is not great but also at any one moment, one chunk can be being read by multiple processes. Because the way this works is one of our workers will be writing chunk one and another worker will be writing chunk two. And both of those workers will be calling on chunk two from the original data. And that basically just glues, you know, gums up the works. Now I'm not, I don't know the details of it. I just know that this is, this somehow is incredibly inefficient. So, and, and as I've said here, this one can be written to ZAR and this one cannot. So the, uh, eventually the solution was to, when we load the data in, was to chunk in the time dimension, uh, we'll make all of our chunks in the time dimension one element long. So that we avoid this point where any chunk will be taken up, be read by two processes at the same time so 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 basically we we i'll scroll back up quickly to show you where this line came in it's, it's in here this was the line which which solved everything so at this point we as we load the data in we chop it up into into ones and then we all we need to do is to to when when we rechunk it on the when we write the holes are all we need to do is to glue together a whole series of one size chunks. And this was the kind of consideration we had. This is the kind of detail we had to get down to, to make this, to make this work. How do I make this picture? Ah, there you go. This was the workflow eventually. So you start with a whole bunch of DAP files, you load them all into X-rays, you rechunk them to smaller in, in the time dimension. You send them all off to the cloud again as ZARs. Then you load all them back together and, <laughs> and concatenate them, rechunk again in the time dimension to make it a sensible size chunks. And then finally you get to this seat, this czar, which covers a whole, a full season of data. And the, and the result is, unless I've skipped any light cells here, the result is um, some large czar files, which can be lazily loaded and, and processed in these efficient ways. So I've just loaded this one, which is from one of these radars, and it's not actually the full, full data set. It's one of the seasons, it's 150 gigabytes. And um, you can do some, some things pretty efficiently on this. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip this one because it's relatively boring, but let's go to this line here. This is, um, this is an example of why we want this <clears throat> to be stored as a czar because we often want to do this kind of thing. We want to make a plot, one of those depth time plots, but not just for one day, but for like however long this is, three months. 
and it's 150 gigabytes, we actually have to look at most of that data to get to, to, to make this plot. So, if, well, we don't have we, maybe half of the data to make that plot. So the first thing we need to subset, we only want to look at one of the, the attenuator settings. We also, we want to skip out the first, oops, we want to skip out the first few um, data sets because that was testing in Alulasat. That wasn't actually the real data. We also want to compute the decibels from these complex values. It doesn't matter, but that's basically some functions like log and absolute value kind of function. We also want to compute the mean in, within each burst. So there's a, there's a reduction step there. We, we also can't load the whole result of these three operations into our notebook. That will still be way too big. So we need to course and in time. There's that line. And finally, we want to plot. And that's, we've got 20 more seconds and we'll, we'll have the final result of this, of this process. But while we're waiting for that, my take home message is in trying to do this, uh, when attempting to write your own data to the ZAR, to a ZAR store is having a, you have to have a really clear idea of the structure of the data from the very beginning. You really need to know everything about it and what structure of an X-ray makes most sense. And you have to carefully consider the chunking you want your final data set to have. And you, your workflow, however, it, however you work, however, however it works, you have to end up with, uh, we have to avoid loading the whole data set into memory. At least I did. And that's why that workaround where I was writing individual ZARs came in. And also you have to, you have to make sure that you res, the, res, the result of your workflow is uniform chunks in, in, within each dimension. Yeah, question. Yeah, how much time? How, how much time do I have to speak? Oh, okay, good. Uh, so, okay, great question. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think I heard the second part of your. So this making it negative one just makes it the whole length of the of the data, the whole length of that dimension. That's just a convention. The only real thing which is doing anything here is is this one, which is making it the time in one to one. So I, I did go over things pretty fast, but we do have two and a half minutes left. So does anyone have any more questions? So this was really just like a very specific kind of example of some of the issues you come up against. Um, but I will say that this... According to George Liu, who's the grad student working on this now, this has made it possible. You know, the way the way I see these cloud optimized things is that it makes simple things possible to do on huge data sets. Like if I wanted to take the average, or if I wanted to make this plot, which is taking ages to show up, if I wanted to do that, it would be a huge amount of work to to individually load each of these things, make it make reduce that data somehow save the result and then move on to the next thing whereas this is just one line of code now after all this work which was a lot but this one line of code does something which would take i don't know how long in loop looping through a bunch of data so that in this case it really has worked out to be a useful tool despite all the extra work Yeah, so this is kind of getting into a lot of our like understanding about metadata and creating usable data formats. And a lot of what's important in open science is making, you know, a lot of this data usable, right? If no one can open your data, if no one can, you know, read it, if it takes us like a month to figure out how to do all of that, it really cuts down on the efficiency of of being able to do science on it. And Right now, there's we're working on ways to be able to incentivize creating data like this, where now that Johnny's put in all this work to create this amazing czar data set, everyone can access it in seconds and work on it super easily, and they don't need to know hardly anything about it. Um, there's more incentive structures that are being built right now. They're in creation to make it better for us to do that. 
and it does take training. And right now, none of us really get training in how to create sort of data. Um, but it is one of the most important things right now. In CryoCloud, our biggest roadblock is data not being in the cloud. And if it's not in the cloud, it's in a format that is not readable by the cloud. Like for data is going into the cloud in zip files, which cannot be opened in an X-ray. And people are doing it in non-optimized formats like HDF5, which are much slower and um, and not as usable as, as something like a czar array. And so it's 10 times or 100 times slower to open it. And we can fix all of this by now, instead of using for formats that are 20 years old, we can use some of these new data formats that um, that work a lot more easily. And it really just takes learning about these how how to properly put it in here um, into these data formats to like make this more usable. So instead of having one or two people who are experts who like were willing to get into the weeds to figure out your data, now anyone can use it super easily. And so it makes it much more impactful. So that is why a lot of the work that Johnny has been doing is super, super um, valuable for us. Thank you. Well, thank you. There is a, a good, to follow up on the points before, there's a good NASA white paper on all of the different uh, data formats and sort of, there's reason actually ZAR doesn't get used and because for archiving, Amy probably knows a lot more about this than me, but ZAR for DAX and things, ZAR does have some issues. Um, so this, um, I'm not a big fan of HDF, but there's a reason, sometimes a necessary evil. <laughs> 